North Korea, to me, and I think to m most people would agree, is probably the lowest hanging fruit for the liberty movement. It is the least free nation on earth. It is a huge symbol of the horrors of, cap of communism, the horrors of dictatorship and totalitarianism. So I said, and we, we also, there's a lot of hand wringing about how do we get people thinking about these ideas and uh, concerned about the ideas that we're so passionate about, the ideas of liberty. And everyone in America is a libertarian vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. So I went there uh, a couple of years back. Uh, this is me uh, with the great leader Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il on the right. And I guess I'm the Holy Ghost in this uh, trinity. And I bought armfuls of the propaganda. And usually when I write a book with a celebrity, I sit down, I work with them, we interview, we go back and forth. I did not have that privilege here. Uh, but there was no doubt, people asked me, how do you know what Kim Jong-il really thought about different issues? And the idea that people in North Korea don't know what he thought about everything is kind of crazy because we know what he thought about magic tricks and gymnastics and cooking and architecture and cinema and, and opera and music and even dance notation because he wrote about all these things. And in fact, when you live in that country, you have to know what he thinks about everything because if you go against it, you're defying the state. And when you defy the state, it has very negative consequences. And I think one of the biggest problems I had and what I tried to set out to do with this book is to fight this idea that North Korea is a carnival. I met with a woman who runs a, a group fighting for human rights in North Korea. And she said, this is a big problem they face. They face the idea that it's been kind of fetishized, that people look at it as a joke. And there's two ways to change that approach. You can either ignore it and try to have, move the conversation over here, or you could do what I did, which is you step into the spotlight where the attention is now, which is on Kim Jong-il the clown. And once you're in that spotlight is to change people's understanding of what he means and what he represents and what life is really like over there. Because Ayn Rand, when she spoke in, 19, in the 1950s in front of the House on American Activities Committee, she was being interviewed by this uh, Congress in Pennsylvania. And incredulously, he goes, you know, I know Russians. Don't they visit their mothers-in-law? Don't they have, you know, picnics? And she goes, you have to understand, it's almost completely impossible for a free people to know what it's like to live under a totalitarian dictatorship. And in a way, it's a good thing that you don't know. Yes, they visit their mothers-in-law, but they're living in complete terror from morning to night. And at night, you're waiting for the doorbell to ring where anyone can do anything to you, where human life means nothing and you know it. And that's something else that I think most people in the West don't understand. North Koreans increasingly are aware of just how bad they have it. And in fact, the propaganda has changed. The propaganda used to be the whole world envies us. We have it so great. And as more and more people went to China and to the South and word got back, because it's very hard to fight word of mouth, now the propaganda is, yes, we're poor, but we're building happier tomorrow. It's very easy to convince the people who have no access to the outside world that they're wealthy and happy. It's very difficult to convince the people that they have more food on their plate than they did a year ago or that their children aren't hungry. Uh, and the way they fight these things are just so tragic. For example, when the famine first started hitting in the 90s, Kim Jong-il launched a campaign that was called Let's Eat Two Meals a Day Instead of Three. Because the idea is if you're less hungry, then you won't need as much food. It's just a matter of willpower. And yes, we understand it's oppressive, but we don't understand just how oppressive it is. For example, everyone in the whole country once a week has to engage in a criticism session where you get up and you didn't say what you did wrong this week, and then your neighbors or your colleagues have to get up and denounce you. And this happens every week for everyone in the entire country. Everyone is always watching each other. There's never a moment of peace. So yes, when they repeat these absurd Kim Jong-il stories or they smile and nod, uh, they have to do it because they have guns to their head. It's not like a Democrat versus Republican thing where I'm putting my point of view across, you're putting your view you across. You have to parrot the views of the regime. And if there's any chance that you're saying something that can be regarded as wrong, there will be very big consequences. And North Korea does something else that's unique and, and particularly reprehensible. You know, Rick Santorum, who's a wonderful person that everyone loves, uh, is fond of saying that the family is the basic unit of society. Well, I don't know what he thinks the word unit means, but in my dictionary, unit is that which cannot be reduced any further. And in North Korea, they take this seriously. 
The family is the basic unit of society in North Korea, so that when you are punished for a crime, they punish your entire family. In fact, they come for you in the middle of the night, three generations are taken to the camps, and you're never sure who it was that got your whole family sent there. And sometimes people even get released from these camps. It's, it's not always a death sentence, but that is what it's like, you know, living in a nation where the family is the basic unit of society. So one of the things I tried to do with this book uh, was to maintain his tone but at the same time laying bare in a paddle, palatable way in the kind of book you can read on the plane or a book you can read on a train, what their history was, what their worldview is like. They're not crazy in any sense. They have an internal logic of their own. And for a nation that's supposedly so crazy and so suicidal, somehow they've managed to outlast all these other nations. So clearly they're doing something right. In the 90s when the famine hit, rather than having the UN come in and, and send people food, they were just shown around to the best places and everything looked great. And Kim Jong-il chose to have 10% of his nation starve rather than allow the UN to send food. And he recognized this. He said, if we let the people fend for themselves, they won't need the government, so we can't have that happen. So anytime you see these you know, articles about Dennis Rodman or uh, there was a piece in, I think it was The Guardian, where they referred to Kim Jong-un's mini-skirted robot army about the women you know, marching in lockstep in parades, they're denying the humanity of these 24 million people who are suffering enormously. Uh, they are treating it as a carnival when it's not a carnival, it's a bloodbath. Uh, I always compare Kim Jong-il to the Batman villain, the Joker, where everyone sees the clown, but no one's mentioning the bodies behind him. So it was my hope in writing this book to have, yes, a very kind of humorous and tongue-in-cheek approach as a way to get people interested in the subject. I think most people who are interested in liberty are interested in the subject. And once they start to realize what it's like that's going on over there, they start to wonder how it is they could have ever found any aspect of the situation humorous of the slightest.